Bible, especially as it pertains to Genesis chapter 1. And I thought, based upon some information that I received about some uh, online uh, comments regarding the Bible and the God of the Bible, I thought we might talk a little bit about uh, Genesis 1. You know, when you look at Genesis 1 and verse 1, you read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I submit to you that really you have a very logical beginning of the Bible considering the fact that where everything came from is a logical place to begin. Meaning, I mean, what, what are the most important questions of life? I would contend that it's logical to conclude why you were here is a very logical question to ask. I mean, if you've never asked the question, why do I exist? Uh, you're really missing out on, on life. If you've never asked where you came from or where you're going or how you get to where you should want to go, then you're missing out on the biggest questions of life. And it doesn't get any more fundamental than where did I come from? And that's where the Bible begins. And I would contend graciously begins by telling us where we came from. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, allegedly the Bible is unscientific, and yet I would contend that it's atheistic evolution that's extremely unscientific. Because atheistic evolution says that everything came from nothing, that life came from non-life, that uh, complex functional design in nature did not have a designer, that intelligence came from that which is not intelligent. When have we ever seen that happen in nature? Or that morality, if one believes in such, came from that which is amoral. You know, the creation account actually makes perfect sense in light of true science, in light of the law of causality, the law of the first two laws of thermodynamics, as well as the law of biogenesis, that in nature life comes from life and that of its own kind, that in fact the creation account is lines itself perfectly with what we know from true science. I'm going to expound upon some of this, hopefully, a little bit more here in the next few minutes. So where did everything come from? Again, the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. For some people, I understand this is a little bit too, they would contend too simplistic. What is the other option? Well, atheistic, cosmological evolution says that everything begins with the formation of stars and planetary systems, proceeds to complex, to primitive and complex life, and culminates with intelligence. Notice intelligence just came from, came from what? Came from just matter that wasn't intelligent. Never seen that happen. Technology and astronomers contemplating the universe. So we went from, you know, matter to intelligent beings that contemplate the universe. This story of the universe, of life, of the life of the universe and our place in it, is known as cosmic evolution. Or maybe you've heard it more like this in your textbooks, that about 13 to 15 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated in one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. For some unknown reason, this region exploded. This explosion was called the Big Bang. One of the results of the Big Bang was the formation of galaxies all, all racing away from one another. And what have some of the leading atheistic uh, scientists of the last half century said about these things? Well, on the Discovery Channel's uh, show that they had a few years ago called Curiosity, the first episode they ever put out was called Did God Create the Universe? And the one who was hosting this particular episode and narrating it was the well-known, famed cosmologist, I probably don't even have to name him because you probably already know who it is, Dr. Stephen Hawking, who on you know, television, where probably millions of people heard him and watched him say this, space and energy were spontaneously created in the Big Bang. It's always interesting to me how uh, so many leading atheistic evolutionists use creation terminology to explain what happened supposedly at the beginning. I mean, spontaneously created. Well, how can you have a created anything without a creator? Well, what he means is supposedly out of nothing came space and energy which 
begat the explosion of the cosmic egg that then inflated into the allegedly universe that we see still expanding today. And what is it that caused the Big Bang? He answered it on television. He said, no doubt in front of millions of people, nothing caused the Big Bang. Those were his exact words. So where did everything come from? It came from a Big Bang. Which came from what? Which came from nothing. Have you ever seen nothing produce something? I mean, really, I, I, I know we could chuckle about that, but I'm just, I've, I've never looked in my backyard and seen a hippo come from nothing. I've never seen a Mercedes appear in my driveway from nothing. And I would welcome that because I'm still driving around a 2001 Toyota Sienna minivan while my wife, she gets to drive a special car in the family. It's a 2008 Toyota Sienna minivan. Sorry for all the Ford fans. I'm just... I've just I, I had Toyotas for a while, okay? They keep lasting, so I keep driving them, and, and they're, they're both used anyway. So that's what I'm, but you know what I've never seen is a car just appear in my driveway or an animal in my backyard from literally nothing. But supposedly, rest assured, friends, that an entire physical universe can. And Dr. Stephen Hawking was not the only one to say such things. Again, leading atheist Dan Barker, whom we quoted last hour. He was in a debate with the theist Todd Friel, in which Todd Friel asked him, do you really believe that something came from nothing? Talking about the universe. And this was Dan Barker's simple answer. Yes. That the whole universe... So the Bible is supposedly unscientific. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And yet, we're told that atheistic evolution, that cosmic evolution, biological evolution, that that's somehow scientific. Well, I would contend that's absolutely not the case. You know, on national television in Australia a few years ago, I think this was 10 years ago now, and you can, you can go to YouTube and you can watch... Uh, this interaction that Richard Dawkins, probably the most famous atheist in the world today, that he had on, on national television down there in, um, down under, right, down in Australia. He was asked about getting something from nothing. And he was on a panel, as I recall, with uh, one man who was a religious individual. I don't remember what his religious affiliation was at this time. And then one who seemed to be kind of the moderator. And he was asked about getting something from nothing, and this was his response. Dr. Dawkins' response. Of course, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't seem really what's right or natural, that you can get something from nothing. Of course, he said, common sense doesn't allow you to get something from nothing. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dawkins, for letting us know that if we use our common sense, then you cannot come to the conclusion that in nature you could get nature from that which is nothing. But then he went on to say, that's why it's interesting, it's got to be interesting in order to give rise to the universe at all. Something very mysterious had to give rise to the origin of the universe. Well, yeah, I would say that. I would say something very mysterious gave rise to the universe. Something that uh, is not human, something that as one writer wrote, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of this person, of this God, how unsearchable are his ways, his, his judgments, and his ways past finding out. Something pretty mysterious had to be behind it all, and Richard Dawkins and others say it was nothing. I will say that Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is probably one of the more well-known astrophysicists today, he was speaking at the Museum of Natural History in New York a few years ago. And it was at the uh, Isaac Asimov Memorial Debate. And Tyson indicated this, and I'm quoting from him, it's not too hard to imagine that some other creature out there is far smarter than us. Hmm. Uh, this gentleman, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, 
does not call himself an atheist. He refers to himself as agnostic. He just says he doesn't know. He hasn't seen that there's evidence for God. But he says that it wouldn't surprise him if there was some creature out there smarter than us. He went on to say that we are, quote unquote, some sort of alien simulation. That's what he said about us. That at least that's what it appears to him. He said, it is easy for me to imagine that everything in our lives is just the <coughs> creation, creation of some other entity for their entertainment. I'm saying the day we learn that it is true, I will be the only one in the room saying I'm not surprised. That's what one of the leading agnostics in America said just a few years ago in New York City at the Museum of Natural History. Isn't it interesting that he, he is not surprised, he would not be surprised whatsoever if we are the, the simulated creation of an alien civilization whom he's never seen. But he has not seen any evidence that there is an eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing God who created the physical realm. You know, there was an article that appeared in New Scientist a few years ago called The Beginning, What Triggered the Big Bang? And this actually came only a couple of months after a list, after an article had, that appeared uh, about the Big Bang, where another astrophysicist basically said a lot of the stuff, and I'm summarizing his statement. His name was Dr. Peter Coles. Um, and he basically said, a lot of the things that you hear about the Big Bang, we don't have evidence for. And he made some, um, he made some statements and confessions in that article that were somewhat mind-blowing. That uh, basically he said, you know, in, he talked about what kind of gave the Big Bang its oomph, but actually we have no evidence for that. So we just assume that that's what happened. And he basically said there's, there's no evidence for that. So after that article came out, about a month and a half to two months later, this article came out, which was kind of odd having two articles about the same subject matter in this particular magazine at such close proximity in time. I can only suppose, I can only guess, that maybe this article came out the time it did because they were trying to kind of appease some individuals who didn't like Dr. Peter Coles who is an evolutionary cosmologist, what he had to say about the universe and the beginning of the universe and the Big Bang. And so David Shiga, in this article, The Beginning, What Triggered the Big Bang, David Shiga said, well, maybe it was this, and maybe it was that, or maybe this model was correct. And so he gave all these, what he would refer to as possibilities. Maybe this is the explanation, maybe that's the explanation, and then, then he concluded with these words. I want you to read what he said. He said, the most likely outcome, however, is that none of the models that he had just talked about will be proved correct anytime soon. Indeed, the quest to understand the origin of the universe seems destined to continue until we can answer a deeper question. Why is there anything at all instead of nothing? Why? You see, if you are an atheist, and you believe that there is nothing outside of the material realm. And you are an atheist who believes, like Stephen Hawking, like Dan Barker, uh, like Richard Dawkins and others, on, on record as saying nothing caused the Big Bang, then David Shiga, I appreciate his honest assessment, asked, why is there anything at all? in the physical realm, instead of nothing. Because zero plus zero is always what? Zero times zero is zero. Zero divided by zero is zero. Zero minus zero is zero. Whenever you have nothing, and you don't add anything to nothing, you're always going to have nothing. And so this is a logical question that was asked in a very pro-atheist evolutionary magazine. Why is everything all of a sudden nothing? I submit to you that it doesn't take much more than common sense to know this. In fact, maybe you've heard the story that I have yet to find out where it came from, and thus, if I did, I would happily attribute uh, to that person this story. But uh, as the story goes, one day a young skeptic said to an elderly lady, I, I once believed in God. 
But since studying science, I'm convinced that God is but an empty word. By the way, there are plenty of scientists who are not atheists, by the way. But anyway, as the story goes, the lady responded, well, I haven't studied science, but since you have, maybe you can tell me from whence came this egg. Why, of course, from the hen, was the reply. And where did the hen come from? Well, why the egg? And perhaps, <laughs> said the lady, you can tell me which existed first. The hen, of course, rejoined the young man. To which the woman responded, You mean that the hen existed without having come from an egg? Oh no, said the young man. I should have said the egg was first. Then you mean that an egg existed without having come from a hen? The young man cried, You've got me all mixed up. <laughs> she drove home her point. Young man, since you can't explain the existence of even a hen, or an egg without God. You can't expect me to believe that you can explain the existence of the whole universe without me. The whole universe. You see, there is something that we know that is very real. And it's called the law of causality, or the law of cause and effect. It's not a law that we define every day. I mean, you, you can define it. You can understand it as every material effect needing to have an adequate antecedent or simultaneous cause. Meaning, I got to uh, Michigan somehow, some way. If I told you I drove up here, you could believe that. If I told you I flew up here, you could believe that. If I told you that I rode on the back of an orange up here, or I took a ride on a half-pound bird, and that's how I got here. You would quickly know that those are silly alleged causes of such an effect. They're not great enough causes to make such an effect. You see, we use the law of cause and effect all of the time. We just don't call it the law of cause and effect. We don't define it as the law of cause and effect. But, as has been noted for many decades now and understood, this is the ultimate canon of the sciences, the foundation of them all. If we did not believe the truth of causation, namely that everything which has a beginning has a cause, and then in the same circumstances, the same things invariably happen, all the sciences would at once crumble to dust. In every scientific investigation, this truth is assumed. Based upon what we see in nature, every material effect must have an adequate antecedent or simultaneous cause. So here's a question. What caused the entire universe? Or if you want to believe in multiverses, then what caused all of the many verses? By definition, universe means one verse. And now people are trying to explain, well, where did our universe came from? Well, you know, maybe we're one universe and many multiverses, and you just happen to stumble upon a universe where there's life, and that's our universe. Okay, whatever with all of that stuff. Whether it's our one universe or the comic book multiverses, where did everything in the material realm come from? I submit to you that the idea that I rode on the back of an orange up here to Michigan from southern Alabama makes a lot more sense than the entire universe developed from a period size or smaller cosmic egg that exploded for some unknown reason, atheistic evolutionists have admitted. That it's a lot more believable to think that I rode up here on a little matchbox car, or a hummingbird, or a bluebird, or a cardinal. We use the cause and effect, and the law of cause and effect all the time. The fact is, matter demands a maker. So says the law of causality. So says the first law of thermodynamics, that in nature, matter and energy are neither created nor destroyed. So here's a question for us, like David Shiga, or the one who wrote the article on the Big Bang that we quoted from earlier. You know, we have to ask ourselves, if there was nothing at one time, why is there anything today? That question is a logical question because matter and energy in nature are neither created nor destroyed. Now you can change, you can burn a piece of wood and it goes from matter into energy, but the amount of that is the same. So says science, and thus we have recognized, we don't make up, but whether atheist or, or creationist, 
theist, whether evolutionist or creationist, we understand that this is a law of science, whether we like it or not. And you know what it says? It says that you don't get something from nothing in nature. So where did nature come from to begin with? Some might say, maybe a minority of individuals might say, well, maybe the universe has just been around forever. The whole eternal universe idea. There's two problems with that. Number one, why does everyone try to come up with a cause of the universe, i.e. the Big Bang or something else, if you think the universe has always been around? So most people haven't. Furthermore, there's a, another law of science, as we noted earlier, the second law of thermodynamics, which says basically that the universe is not winding up, it's winding down. That the amount of usable matter and energy in the universe is becoming less usable over time. Or there's something called entropy that is increasing, which is, in essence, means that should show us and recognize we should that the universe is not eternal. Well, if, you, if the universe is not eternal, and the universe could not, have, could not have created itself, then how did the universe get here? I submit to you that Genesis 1-1 is a very logical question in light of science, in light of common sense, in light of just philosophical reasoning. That in the beginning, a being who is eternal in nature, who is outside of the natural realm, who is super natural or natural, created the natural realm. And that's the only logical conclusion that one could come to given the evidence that we have. You see, what happens so often is that atheistic evolutionists illogically endow nature with the ability to behave super naturally or supernaturally. You know, to get around the problems that we've just presented to naturalists or atheistic evolutionists, well, then how do you, you know, how do you get around some of these problems? Well, maybe you would say, as Ken Ami pointed out in his article, True Free Thinker, some might suppose, atheists would suppose, that it's ignorant and superstitious to believe that God made everything out of nothing, but supposedly it's rational and scientific to believe that nothing made everything out of nothing. Have you ever seen nothing create anything? Especially anything that is fine-tuned, like our universe? Anything that is complex and functionally designed and working, like the solar system in which we live, like the human body that you have and inhabit. It's rational and scientific to believe that nothing made everything out of nothing, but it is supposedly irrational to believe that God, a, an eternal, omnipotent, omniscient being, which the evidence, I would contend, demands. Supposedly it's ignorant and superstitious to believe that God is eternal, but it's rational and scientific to believe that matter is eternal. If this is referring to those who might believe that the universe is eternal. So what you've done is you've attributed to the natural realm a supernatural quality. You see, when the Apostle Paul talked about those who refuse to have God in their knowledge, despite the evidence, where did the heavens come from? Where did all of the heavenly bodies come from? 3,000 years ago, there was someone who wrote, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. In fact, he went on to talk about whether it is in the daytime or the nighttime, people should understand this truth. Day unto day, utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. It doesn't matter where you live, what language you speak. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The shouting of the inanimate objects in the heavens that declare their maker's glory. Their line or their voice has gone out through all the earth. 
and their words to the end of the world. I don't read from Psalm 19, 1 through 4 to say, oh, this proves that God exists. I'm telling you, this is an argument for the existence of God. Someone like Hebrews 3, 4, every house is built by someone, but who builds everything? But all things were made or built by God. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4. Supposedly, God is an effect and must have a cause. But matter is the uncaused first cause? Is that what we're supposed to believe? You see, what happens is naturalists, they attach supernatural terminology and supernatural abilities to nature and say nature is all there is. But that is illogical. That is unreasonable. You must have a supernatural creator to make a natural realm because you can't get something from nothing. If God made everything, then who made God? Supposedly, matter made everything and nothing made matter. And it's perfectly fine to believe that. But there's no problem with us asking what caused God. Where did God come from? People ask that question a lot, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with asking that question. We should expect that that question will be asked. And maybe you yourself have wondered about that. Well, let me just say, remind us that this law of causality or law of effect is based upon what we see in nature. That every material effect must have an adequate antecedent or simultaneous cause. You see, when, when, when we recognize scientific laws, they're based upon what you see in nature. Whether it is the law of gravity, or the law of biogenesis, or the law of cause and effect, or the laws of thermodynamics. These are based on what we see in nature. But by definition, God is not natural. In fact, I would suggest this. When the question of where did God come from, although it is a fine question to ask, it's actually, logically speaking, it is an illogical question. What do you mean it's an illogical question? Well, it's an illogical question because it is somewhat equivalent to asking, well, when did eternity begin? Well, if your son or your daughter, a child, asked you, hey, Dad, when did eternity start? Well, you would explain to them, by definition, by the very word eternity, eternity didn't have a beginning. Well, if someone asked, when did eternity end? Or when does eternity end? You would say, by the definition of the word eternity, that means that there's not an end to it because eternity in itself, the word inherently means no beginning and no end. Similarly, when someone asks, well, where did God come from? Well, God, by his very definition, and as the Bible defines him, he is from everlasting, the psalmist says, to everlasting. He didn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end, and so to ask the question, where did God come from, is, it's fine to ask the question, but it is actually an illogical question. Every house, the Bible says, is built by someone, but you've built all things, is God. I'm not saying, hey, this proves that God exists. Again, quoting the Bible, I'm saying that he's using an argument for God. Both heaven and earth reveal. I submit to you that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible, which is what the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. And I quote this verse to say, this is exactly what we have been discussing. That in the beginning, a supernatural, unseen, eternal, uncreated, all-powerful, all-knowing, by his very definition, God created the heavens and the earth. Not only does matter demand a maker, I would suggest to you that Genesis chapter 1 is perfectly accurate and scientific because life in nature demands a life giver. I mean, you might define evolution like George A. Kirkcutt did many years ago when he said there's a theory that all living forms and the world have arisen from a single source, which itself came from an inorganic form. This theory can be called the general theory of evolution. That life came from non-life and perpetuated 
itself. It's an idea known as, as abiogenesis or spontaneous generation that you can get life from non-life. But let me ask you something. Not only have you and I or anyone else never seen matter come from nothing, we've never seen life come from non-life in nature. I mean, I have a dog at my house. He's about 12 years old. His name is Shaq. He's a half weenie dog, half Springer Span. The people who gave him to us said, you know, he's kind of an accident. Neighbor dog over here, he was a weenie dog. We have a Springer Spaniel. We call this dog a Spring Weenie. He's, <laughs> listen, if I said, well, where did that weenie dog come from? Oh, well, he just came out of nowhere. He just, he literally popped into existence. Well, where did that Springer Spaniel come from? Same thing, just popped into existence. You see, no one believes that on a microscopic level, or on a larger animal or life level. You know why? Because for the last few centuries, scientific experiments have proven it. Since the days of Francisco Mead, since the days of Louis Pasteur, we have known that even on a microscopic level, this does not happen. It would be against the law of biogenesis to say that it does. In fact, one evolutionist said years ago, said according to this story, evolution, Every tree, every blade of grass, and every creature in the sea and on the land have all that one parent strand of molecular matter drifting lazily in a warm pool. What concrete evidence supports that remarkable theory of the origin of life? So there is none. See, what we know is that in nature, life comes from life and that of its own kind. This is the scientific law that we have recognized over the centuries known as the law of bio-life genesis beginning, the law of bio-genesis. And evolutionists, atheistic evolutionists, have recognized this. George, a., uh, George Gaylord Simpson said a few years ago, several years ago, he said there is no serious doubt that biogenesis is the rule that life comes from other life. J.W. Sullivan said many years ago, he said the beginning of the evolutionary process raises a question which is yet unanswerable. What was the origin of life on this planet? Till fairly recent times, there was a pretty general belief in the occurrence of spontaneous generation. That is, before the days of Francisco Reedy, Louis Pasteur, and other scientists who have done. You remember those experiments in your science textbooks where Francisco Reedy's experiments where he had jars with meat in them, and he covered some of the jars, and some of the jars were left uncovered. Some had gauze on them, and you would see the flies landing on the meat, and, and in some jars you wouldn't see that because they were covered. And, and then you remember the the illustrations and the information in the biology textbooks of Louis Pasteur where he had the flasks with the curved neck and the broth in it. And he was, long story short, he proved. Uh, even though people used to believe in spontaneous generation, that really doesn't happen. J.W. Sullivan said, careful experiments, notably those of Pasteur, showed that this conclusion, spontaneous generation, life from non -life, was due to imperfect observation, and it became an accepted doctrine that life never arises except from life. So far as the actual evidence goes, this is still the only possible conclusion. But since it is a conclusion that seems to lead back to some supernatural creative act, it is a conclusion that scientific men find very difficult to accept. So why is that? Not all scientific men or women, by the way, but some who are pure atheistic naturalists and evolutionists, yeah, they don't really want to accept this. Why? Because it implies that there must have been someone who created life because life does not come from non-life. Notice a similar statement that was made by the Nobel laureate, Dr. George Wald of Harvard University. I have this article in my office where he noted the reasonable view, that was at one time, was to believe in spontaneous generation. The only alternative to spontaneous generation of life from non-life, the only alternative to believe in a single primary act of supernatural creation. Those two. He says there is no third position. This man's an atheistic, was an atheistic evolutionist. He went on to say this in his article. Most modern biologists, having reviewed with satisfaction the downfall of the spontaneous generation hypothesis, yet unwilling to accept the alternative belief in special creation, are left with nothing. 
sound kind of similar to the previous quotation, doesn't it? He says, I think a scientist has no choice but to approach the origin of life to a hypothesis of spontaneous generation. Do you see what he just concluded there? That we must somehow believe the very thing that the evidence says does not happen. Does that sound logical to you? Does that sound scientific to you? Does this sound like the Bible is not scientific or that evolutionary, atheistic evolutionary science is not scientific? Did life spontaneously generate nature from non-life or was it specially created? You know, one of, if not the world's most well-known atheistic philosopher of the last half of the 20th century, Dr. Anthony Flew, who debated, by the way, one of our brothers in Christ um, a few years ago, well, back in actually 1976, uh, Thomas B. Warren, in down in Denton, Texas. But years later, toward the end of his life, Anthony Flew co-authored a book titled There is a God, in which he said the only satisfactory explanation for the origin of such indirected, self-replicating life as we see on earth is an infinitely intelligent mind. I don't quote Dr. Anthony Flew to say this is why you should believe in God, and this is why you should believe in the scientific accuracy of the Bible. I'm suggesting to you that everyone who is not a believer in God and the God of the Bible should consider what he's saying. That he came to the conclusion, sadly it took him toward the end of his life, but he finally did come to the conclusion that there is a God. The book is subtitled How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. And I'm going to read this statement again. He said, the only satisfactory explanation for the origin of such indirected, self-replicating life, like we see here on earth, is an infinitely intelligent mind. How did life get here? Did it come about by time and chance from nothing over billions of years? What evidence do we have indicates that? Nothing, nothing in science indicates that. According to Nobel laureate, Dr. George Wall, there's only two alternatives. I mean, there's, there's only two possibilities. That it was that one, which science says doesn't happen. Or we are supernaturally created by a supernatural creator. Which is exactly what Genesis 1 has taught for thousands of years. That a supreme, eternal, uncreated, all-powerful God created every living thing and did so according to their kind. You see, the, the Bible tells us that those things that God made on day three, all the vegetation, that according to its kind, whose seed is in itself. You know what that means? It's saying that the apple tree is going to produce apples that have seeds in them, that produce apple trees, that produce apples that have seeds in them, that produce apple trees, that produce apples that have seeds in them, etc. You know what the Bible says about the animals that were created on day five? That God created them according to their kind. We didn't. You know what the Bible says about the animals that were created on day six? That they were created according to their kind. You know what evolution says? Evolution says that in the beginning was matter. Actually, there was nothing. That gave way to matter. That supposedly... We got the amoeba, which we got the worm, which we got the fish, which we got the amphibian, the reptile, the lower mammal, the lemur, the monkey, and man who supposedly imagined God. And this is supposedly our genealogy. This is what it looks like in a lot of classrooms around the country and in textbooks. That you have, you know, a single cell organism that came from where exactly? That evolved into worms, fish, amphibians, reptiles, lower mammals, lemurs, ape-like creatures. And man. That's what the story of evolution says. That's what they report in magazines and books, on TV all the time. And yet the law of biogenesis, a law of recognized all around the world, says in nature life comes from life. And that 
of its own kind. You know what you've never done is you've never gone to a hospital and seen a human being beget or give birth to an orangutan. Never seen that. You've never seen an orangutan give birth to a human. You've never seen a hippo give birth to a giraffe. You've never seen a chicken lay an egg and a snake came out. You might see a snake in the chicken coop, but it didn't come from a chicken egg. You know, we know this because we recognize it every day, all around the world. This is a fundamental law of biology, the law of biogenesis. In the material universe, life arises from previously existing life of its own kind. Life cannot, it does not, it cannot spontaneously generate in nature from non-chemicals. Thus, a supernatural intelligent mind must have created living organisms. And I will say as we conclude here that when God made animals on days five and six and he made human beings on day six, he made them differently than the earth. He made them differently than the water. He made them differently than the trees, than the grass, than the dirt. You see, intelligence demands an intelligent creator. Anything that, it, that possesses intelligence in nature must have been caused by something intelligent. We don't look at rocks or water or dirt or a tree and say, thank you for letting me pass my math test today. We don't thank them for our jobs at Ford or anywhere else. We don't thank a pew that you're sitting on for allowing me to read my Bible or for me coming to the conclusion, the rational conclusion, that God exists and that the Bible is his word. You see, organisms such as animals and humans possess intelligence. My dog possesses a measure of intelligence. He's not intelligent like a person is, but he possesses a measure of it. You know, I can tell my dog to sit, and he'll sit most of the time. I can ask my dog, you want to go outside? He looks out to me, he knows the word outside means out there on the green grass or the brown grass sometimes, depending on what kind of year it is and how much rain we've got. And you know what, when my dog needs to go outside and I haven't asked him, he will come look at me, he might bark, he might run over to the door when he smells cookies and he wants a cookie. You know what he does? He runs to the store, he runs to the kitchen. My dog has a measure of it. But no one, no one is, is anywhere close to intelligent. Nothing on this earth is like the human kind that God created on the six, whom God said he created in his image. And in the context of Genesis chapter 1, it is talking about in contrast to all the animals that God made, he said, let's make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. You see, because of this kind of creation that God made, mankind, male and female. They could have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the, all the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creep of them that creeps on the earth. So the argument goes, therefore animals and human must have been created by an intelligent creator. Matter demands a maker. Life demands a life giver. Intelligence demands an intelligent creator. And you know what? Complex functional design and there's nothing, there's nothing that scientists have ever studied that is more complex than what is in between your two ears. It is, as scientists have noted, the most complex piece of matter in the known universe. So that car you drive, it was designed, manufactured, built by someone. The computer that you use, designed, built, manufactured by someone. The cell phone or computer that you have in your pocket, based on the amount of money that it takes to purchase one of these, uh, based upon your daily or maybe hourly, just about maybe sometimes almost minutely, if that's a word, use of such, you know, with complex functional design demands a designer. What about what is between your two ears? What about your amazing body? 
I know there are some doctors who whose profession is to help people have healthy human bodies. I know there are some who are atheists, but you know most of the ones I've met in my life, they are creationists and they are theists because their study of the amazing human body has led them to, to believe. And I have conversations with my particular doctor on a regular basis, fairly regular, I guess you could say, annually or semi-annually about the amazing complex functional design of the human body, which is silly, it really is silly to think it's the result of a period-sized ball of matter that came from nothing that exploded some 14 billion years ago, and that genetic mutations gave us what we have today. I don't know about you, but I don't generally celebrate any genetic mutations that the doctor tells me that I have. You know why? Because most of us realize that the vast majority, like 99 plus percent of mutations are quite harmful. And are mutations really the mechanism that brought us from being amoebas to worms to fish to amphibians to reptiles to lower mammals to ape-like creatures to humans? Is that really what the evidence indicates? Or does complex functional design demand a designer? Really appreciate your attention tonight. Um, I believe we're going to have a some moments, some time for questions, and so you, would you like me to just begin that now? All right, I know it's uh, about 7.55. I really appreciate your patience with me and allowing me to uh, get through a lot of that material. I'm going to step down here, try to use this lapel mic again, if that's okay, make you perhaps a little bit more comfortable. Uh, me, I know it makes me a little more comfortable when I can be a little closer to you guys and not so far away. Maybe if I put my phone over here, there won't be as much feedback. And let me just see if there are any questions that I may or may not know the answers to. I might be able to help you with. And if not, you may be sitting there thinking, Eric, it's Friday night. I'm tired. It's almost 8 o'clock. I don't feel like answering or asking any questions or hearing any answers. And that's okay. I understand that. I also uh, know that some of you might have one or more. And, and if I could be of uh, help, I will. Again, I may not be. So I'll... Try the best I can. Have any questions, feel free to raise your hands. Or not, just speak out. And if not, that's not a problem. I imagine we, yes, sir. Would you say that existence is part of the nature of God? That existence is, is existence part of the nature of God? I would contend that it is because I, I, would, I would argue or conclude that his eternality is somewhat equivalent to his existence, and if that is part of his nature, and I would argue that the physical realm argues for an eternal being, that yes, that his very existence would be part of his nature. What relevance would the physical eternality have to the nature? Okay. The physical Well, I, I would I, I would conclude that there is no physical eternality, that there is not an eternal physical realm, but that the physical realm had to have been brought in by an eternal being for the physical realm to come into being. And one more thing, if I may. Yes. So uh, you agree with me that. Uh, that God, in fact, is timeless, but not eternal. And the scriptures talk about this in the sign of the name of Carmel as well. I say we're not talking here about an eternity of time, because uh, time itself exists now on the physical. That's right. Earth. And therefore, uh, time does not exist in eternity. I understand what you're saying. And therefore, more defensible. Well, if you, that, uh, that, that might be an appropriate way to say it. Certainly he is timeless. And when I contend that he is eternal, that's what I'm, I'm suggesting, that, it, that he, he is from everlasting to everlasting, that he has no beginning, that he has no end, that he is timeless. And so for me, I see that as two ways of saying the same thing. 
Yes, thank you for the question. And again, I'm not an inspired prophet. I'm not God. I don't know everything, but I'm happy to try to help if I can be of some assistance. Anything? Yes, Chris. Uh, I know that at least it was a supposition of Darwin that at some point everything was made of something. Actually, it would get simpler. But as we found more and more, the more we learn, the more complexity comes into play and the more design that we see. I mean, we look into DNA and, and, and a language, and that's another thing that you say, would a language that's we're just beginning to understand come about of its own? We have, what, what have you, you, you seen along those lines? As, as we get further and further along, we find actually more and more complexity rather than something simple. But that, that's a very good point. I, no one can know for sure. I can't help but ask and wonder about whether Darwin ever would have become um, a naturalistic evolutionist, though Darwin did make statements about being concerned about ever calling himself an atheist because he said, you know, he recognized that if, if there absolutely is no God, then there is no morality, there is no heaven, there is no hell. I'm not saying he didn't change over time, but he made some statements in his writings that make me think that he was more agnostic. And uh, however, I do wonder if Darwin was alive today, whether such amazing complexity that has been uncovered more, especially on a microscopic, you know, cell DNA level, if he would have ever written The Origin of Species or some of his other uh, writings and, and uh, may have been more of a defender of theism. Now, that is totally just my wondering about that. But yes, it is true that, uh, you know, language, language is something that is, uh, that is created. You know, computer languages are created. Uh, a book is written. A, if you want to, you know, I, I've never really watched, um, what's it called? What, what, what show was Spock on? Star Trek. Star Trek. Okay, so I somehow I just lose my train of thought. And, you know, I was told, I, at one time I was told that they came up with some kind of language for, wasn't there a particular civilization? The Klingons, you know? That, that didn't just evolve. And someone had to, you know, kind of think through that. What kind of language are going to be? Some of y'all are, are fans of, of Star Trek. <laughs> you can tell that I've watched a few episodes, and that's about it. But, um, you know, at one time, language didn't exist, and then it was created. I contend there was a language created in the beginning, and uh, then there was a confusion of the languages based upon Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 11, and then you've got multiple languages and maybe more, many more after that as they would be created. But, you know, there are also, you might say, languages in the animal realm. And what I mean by this, where did, how did a honeybee, how did a honeybee think up and, and evolve the ability to go get nectar from a certain flower, fly back to a beehive, and without words, without the ability to verbally or use sign language, communicate to all the other honeybees, but could do a particular kind of dance called a waggle dance, and do it in a particular way and in a particular direction that it communicates to all of the other honeybees in that hive exactly where the nectar is that it got from, that it just came from, the flowers that it just came from, so that those bees could all fly to the exact same place. That, that language just evolved by time and chance over billions of years. That's what atheistic evolutionists would have to conclude. I contend that such amazing language uh, is more evidence of a complex designer, just like computer languages demand a designer, a, a, what I call a techie guy or gal, someone who knows a whole lot more about that than I do. Uh, even if it's 01000111110 language that communicates some astounding, um, you know, communication that allows us to have computers at our fingertips that can function at 
unbelievable, I like light speeds, it seems like to me. Okay, I'm rambling a little bit. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Genesis 1 7 says, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So I was wondering, uh, what is the water above the firmament? It sounds like it's above the sky, not under the sky. Yeah, that's a very good question, and I, I will be. Um, you know, somewhat blunt about that. I don't know 100% sure what that is. If uh, God revealed more to us, if the Bible writers told us more about that, I would feel better about it. Uh, there are a lot of people that believe that this is, you know, the water that's in the heavens, if you will, uh, in, in the clouds, and then there was water on earth, and this firmament was part of the atmosphere, and I'm probably not wording all that correctly, but the fact is, I would have to say, of those things that God created, that is the one day that I am uh, less certain of the particular language and what that word means. We do have an article on our website by a Hebrew scholar, Dr. Justin Rogers, from uh, he teaches Hebrew at Free Harvard University, if I remember correctly, he's the one who wrote that article, and uh, he would uh, you know, have some things to say about it, but I don't recall that he even comes to a firm conclusion. I could be wrong, and maybe my forgetter is working pretty well tonight, but um, you know, that's a good question. I know there are different um, interpretations or uh, speculations or thinkings on this. I mean, I've heard one uh, creation uh, astronomer who fully believes from a scientific perspective and a biblical perspective that there very well may be waters on the outskirts of the universe that God made, and that's what he's talking about. Um, most people tend to believe that this has to do with the atmosphere and the water below it, which is on earth, and kind of in it or right above it, you may say at times with the clouds. I don't know for sure. Thank you for the question, though. Anything else? Yes, sir. Um, once you uh, do so much, you uh, realize that there is a God, how do you then um, uh, get them to see that it is uh, God the Bible? That's a very good question. So the question was, once you, if someone comes to believe that matter demands a maker, life demands a life giver, complex functional design demands a designer, morality, if it exists, which I conclude it does, and if... I shudder to think about individuals like Dan Barker who say it doesn't. Uh, what kind of world that would be to believe in? There's no such thing as morality, but if there is morality, morality demands a moral law giver and an objective standard. If that's the case, and how do you come to the conclusion that, that, that it is the God of the Bible? And the simple, and yet I think it's profound, but the simple answer is, if the Bible has attributes of uh, that are attributed to a divine being, then that divine being must be the God of the Bible. So it is, if the Bible itself is proven to be the words of God, then the God who exists is the God of the Bible. And my contention is, if there is a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, um, etc., then that God, if he wanted, well, if that God exists, you know, based on some of the things we talked about tonight, then he would have the ability, he's all powerful, to communicate to us if he wanted to, right? And if he had the ability and he wanted us, if he wanted his creation and specifically his human creation to know anything, then he could have the ability and if he wanted us to know anything, he would tell us what he wanted us to know, right? And then if he told us what he wanted us to know, he would have the ability, and it is logical to conclude, that he would tell us it was from him. You know, when I, I might play a joke on my wife sometimes, but, you know, generally, when I send my wife a text, like I've sent her today, or when I call her, do I want her to know it's from me? Like, hey, I'm your husband. This is Eric. How are you today? I want to talk to you. I just got a text because I was looking, I guess, at what time it was, or when I was looking at my phone, while I go from, from my, my daughter. Okay, when I call her or text her back, do I want her to know this is me and not some, you know, some other person? Yeah. So it's logical to conclude that if God, who is the creator, if the creator of the universe 
wanted to, communi to communicate anything to us, he could have, he'd have the ability to, he would have if he wanted us to know anything, and he would have told us it was from him, and he would know that simply telling us it's from him, which by the way the Bible tells us literally thousands of times it's from him, I just got through reading through or listening through the book of Jeremiah. You know what Jeremiah says hundreds of times? This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. What does 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 say? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That God would tell us it's from him, but he would also know this. That simply telling us it's from him doesn't prove it's from him. I could tell you I'm from Mars. That doesn't prove I'm from Mars. I could tell you I'm the president of the United States. That doesn't make me the president of the United States. So simply because the Bible writer said it was from them doesn't make it from them. But if there are supernatural attributes of the Bible, for example, if they foretold the future and were correct time and time and time again, if they foretold of the rise of this nation or the fall of this nation, if Isaiah was right when he told that there would be a king who would reign over the Medes and Persians and his name would be Cyrus, end of Isaiah 44, beginning of Isaiah 45, and that that king would allow his people to go back to Jerusalem, which Cyrus did, then such accurate prophetic uh, uh, words are proof of the divine God inspiration of the Bible. So that's a very good question, and I would contend that these, the rather simple answer is if the Bible shows that it is above the ability of humankind to merely make then it must be from God. And thus, the God of the Bible is the God that we seek to serve and prove and help other people come to know about. And we, we do have, a, by the way, a lot of these things, if you go to the apologeticspress.org website, uh, and you just type in these questions, a lot of them, you'll, like there's an article on that very uh, question that one of my colleagues wrote. Yes, sir. Well, I, I would, I, I can't say that I would know that for sure, you know, like how many copies. I, I, I try to be careful assuming too much. It, it, as I understand history, were most people um, able to read and write? Even, I mean, apparently even in the dark ages and middle ages, there were a whole lot of people who weren't. So uh, from what I understand, you know, there weren't a a mass number of copies of scripture like there are today. Um, but I, I, I would say, I would be careful to say, you know, that people who wanted a copy of scripture could not get it. And, and here's my, my point is, uh, if, if God is all powerful, and if he could, like in, in Paul's day, say in Colossians chapter one, that the entire world has, uh, every creature has heard the gospel. I think Paul is using hyperbole there, uh, and he's talking about you know, the gospel has gone out to all the Jews and the Gentiles gone around the world, but I also know that the same God who could walk on water, who could multiply fruit of the vine, who could do this miraculously, that, that, that he knows if there's anyone around the world who needs the gospel, and he could, whether at one time miraculously or today providentially, use people to reach them. I, I was, and I'll, I'll go back to you here in just a moment, f finish your, your statement, um, that I was knocking doors in the Bahamas one time, and these two women came to the door, and they wanted to know what me and my wife, what we wanted, and we asked if they would be willing to study the Bible with us, and they just, it was, as I recall, it was like their jaws just dropped because they said, we have just been praying that someone would come and teach us about God and the Bible. So, you know, I just am thankful that God let us be there. How all that worked out, I don't know. But let me let you finish because I know I kind of interrupted you there. Uh, yeah, perfectly fine. Yeah. And that, that was relevant to my question as well. Um, so, yeah, so the question kind of has like a couple of assumptions apparent to it. So, for instance, one of the first assumptions is that, as I said, for a long period of time, most people, specifically most Christians, would have had access to uh, a Bible and they probably would um, so what uh, a lot of the, you know, the group, well, one, uh, one question that would be raised based on that assumption is um, with respect to that assumption, how would Christians at that time have 
and I, I would contend that if those assumptions are, some of those assumptions are correct, that we have to remember what it was like in the first century where you basically had walking Bibles, where, um, you know, think about Paul walking around and Peter walking around uh, even the first few years after the church was established. As I understand it, it's very likely that um, maybe Galatians or 1 Thessalonians uh, were some of the first epistles, New Testament documents, maybe Mark fairly early, that were written and so there were literally years that after the church was established that people were becoming Christians and the church was growing through the teachings, the verbal teachings of the apostles and New Testament prophets. Now, I do realize that they also were given miraculous gifts to prove that what they were saying was, was uh, you know, they could, they could prove that they were, were, they were prophets. And so for a long period of time, uh, were there people who were continuing to quote scripture and to preach and teach the gospel verbally and that they, those were the Bibles, if you will, that a lot of people heard, uh, that would not surprise me. But I also, uh, I, don't, I don't know that we could, we can't really just know how many copies once you know, we have an article on our website about why did God wait so many years to begin penning the New Testament? Because the church was established in, say, A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, depending on when the birth of Christ was. Some say that was really more like 4 B.C., 3 B.C., not necessarily, you know, 1 B.C. or 1 A.D. Um, well, God had his own reasons, and I don't know exactly what all those reasons were, but I know he did not leave man, people, without the ability to learn the gospel and obey the gospel. Um, at the same time, and again, those are those are good questions and really hard questions, I think. Uh, I recognize that the God of the Bible that I read about, that he always does that which is right. It's part of his very nature, of course. You know, Titus 1, 2, he doesn't lie. Hebrews chapter 6, what is it, verse 18, I think it is. It's impossible for God to lie. And he also says, ask and it shall be given, seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall be opened to you. I understand that correctly. Any human being who's ever lived who wanted to come to know God and obey God, God was going to make it possible for them to. And I fully believe it's still that way today. Whether it's someone living in a, in a country like North Korea or China or in some other uh, a Muslim country that is a little bit more locked down, you might say, to open Christianity. I fully believe if there are honest-hearted individuals in those, in those places, God, whether it's by way of a letter or a book or a human being who is working underground, and we've heard of the Underground Railroad, okay, uh, that, that wasn't just unique, you might say, to one time in history, to one particular kind of effort. Um, that is still going on even today, underground work in countries around the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, the God that I read in Scripture is a God who, as the Bible reveals, is long-suffering to all, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that repentance and remission of sins is to be preached in all nations. It began in Jerusalem, Luke 24, and it spread around the world. And he uses Christians to do that, um, which is interesting. I, I don't believe that God, I don't see any evidence in Scripture that God has ever communicated directly to a non-Christian exactly what they needed to do to be saved. I mean, I, you don't read that in the New Testament, that he always used people and he used the efforts of his people. Now, sometimes he told his people to go do that. Like he told, remember, Philip to go overtake the chariot and to teach that. In the, well, why didn't God just teach the Ethiopian eunuch himself? Why didn't the Spirit of God? I, he doesn't tell us. I just know that God has used people. And so I, I say that as a rallying cry for all Christians, for all of us, to realize that that's the most important work that we can do in the world. It's to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And the greatest way to love our neighbor is to give them what they need 
whether that you think they deserve it or not, and regardless of how much it costs you or me or the Lord's church, that we go wherever we need to go, we do what we need to do, and we say what we need to say in service to Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for that question and all those questions. And um, we don't hear the term soul of scripture a whole lot in this day and time, but I certainly believe that the Bible is all sufficient, it's all authoritative, and it's all that we need, and it's what we have to help people get to heaven. I think that at one time there was a, there was a little bit more of walking Bibles um, and how God used men and women who memorized so much scripture and was able to communicate that. I don't know the extent to that, but I know it was seemingly a good bit. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's a great verse. I was trying to think about that earlier when I mentioned Matthew 7, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find. And I just could not remember that exact reference. But yeah, that's, a, that's a fantastic uh, passage. Proverbs 8, 17. Those who seek me diligently will find me. Very, very good comments. Some of you look like you're getting a little bit tired and I don't want to stay up here you know, too long. We've, we've got about a 25 minute Q&A period. If there aren't any other questions, I've been invited to go eat with someone and I, or, or a group of people. And I said, if I eat this late, I'm going to be up late. And I don't know that I can be up much later. But anyway, so uh, some of you all, if you haven't had supper, you're probably hungry and you probably are ready to kind of wrap this up. Someone's raising his hand over there. Two people are raising their hand over there. They're ready for peanut butter and jelly before bed, I believe. That's right. Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you all. Thank you for being here. I'll hand it back over to Brother Lynn. We want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I know some of the, the talk is a lot, a little technical, but uh, I was able to keep up with him. I did get lost there for a little bit when he talked about that dog. I was, I've been trying to picture that dog in my mind ever since he's mentioned it. Uh, but we want to thank him, and, and I'd just like to add, uh, it's very important that as Christians, we know the Bible ourselves. And there are many times that you may be out and people have questions and you may not have this book with you in your hand, but if you have it in your heart, then you can present that message that needs to be taught. You know, when it talks about beautiful feet, it's not just talking about the preacher that stands in the pulpit. He's talking about all of us. We have a responsibility. And so they searched the scripture uh, in Berea and so I think, uh, or in Thessalonica, and I think that that's uh, something that we need to be doing ourselves. I'm going to ask Michael if he would to come and lead us in a dismissal prayer. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Come back tomorrow night. We'll be talking about uh, dealing with the topic of uh, some of the contradictions that are so-called in the Bible. And so if you have time, come back. Wait for letter to get to back. <laughs>
All right, if you would please bow with me. Oh, wonderful, great Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day, for the many blessings that you pack in every day. Father, we're so grateful for those who work with the Apologetics Press, with their knowledge, with their ability to write articles and uh, to put forth uh, videos and to go around the world preaching and teaching and helping in an area that is so needed in this modern world. Father, we're so grateful for uh, Eric and uh, men like him who, who put aside the, the worldly treasures so that they can preach the word, preach the gospel. Uh, Father, it is our prayer that as they continue to do what they do, they just continue to grow and expand and, and help as many as possible. Uh, thank you, Father, so much for this congregation, for uh, bringing people like Eric all the way up to uh, this mission field so that we can hear a portion of uh, the truth from them uh, from a different perspective, a different kind of uh, view. We are so grateful for all that you do for us. Father, thank you so much for your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.